Um, I got signed to Def Jam Records and they gave me an advance and they had a check that was like, what the f***? You know? <laughs> That's amazing, dude. Yeah, I squandered the money. <laughs> it wasn't completely irresponsible squandering, but it was like mistakes, mistakes that I made. Welcome to the Mike Squires and Friends podcast. I'm your host, Mike Squires. Today, I am joined by my friend, Wax. Today, we're going to be talking about the struggles of a creative, the creative process in general, and what are some things more important than music. So sit back and enjoy this episode. <laughs> I need to know. I need to know about what's early life for Wax, man. Oof. Uh, dang, I've been alive a long time. My early life was in the 1980s. Okay. Take yourself back to a world where VCRs were new. <laughs> Whoa. Where the compact disc was taking over and vinyl was going away. Crazy. Tapes were intermediate. You know, they were kind of like people <laughs> fucked with them or whatever. You know, I was, uh, I have a twin brother. I was raised in Dunkirk, Maryland, which is a small town that's a suburb of Washington, D.C. When I was a kid, it was like rural. And now it's more suburban, you know what I'm saying? Now it's more like it looks like every other town in America with Chipotle and Panera Bread and Jersey Mike's and all that shit back then. To give you an idea how how small my town was, like it was a big deal when McDonald's opened. And I, I shit you not, when, McDonald, when McDonald's in, my, in Dunkirk, Maryland opened, I was 15 years old and they had a grand opening party where like they had a truck where like Ronald McDonald and Grimace, you know, yeah. you, you even know what that is. You know, what Grimace and the hamburger Grimace, and shit. Grimace just had a moment on social media, dude. He I didn't a, know that, but he's the he's the OG Barney. Let's put it that way. But they had a truck where they did like a kids show, and my band played at it. That's my, crazy. my band, which was called McGregor. We played at that show. I have it on tape. Like I have footage of this. That was in 1990. I was 15. I was born in 1979, so it was 1994. And uh, that, that's how long I've been doing music. I've been doing music since I was really little. My, me and my, I have a twin brother. And uh, yeah, we started making music. We watched MTV a lot and stuff. My parents, my dad's a big couch potato. So we just, we watched a lot of television. And me and my brother watched a lot of MTV. So I think that was really influential for us. Anyway, I'm kind of skipping all over the place. I didn't get a lot of sleep last night, so maybe my childhood is, is like a disjointed by Quentin Tarantino childhood. It's like, when I was 15, this happened, but it's because of what happened when I was three. Now, I was real into music. I was a, I have a twin brother and an older sister. We're all adopted. So, like, me and my brother are, were adopted as a team. You know, we're identical twins. We're blood related yeah. but uh that was kind of interesting an interesting thing about being adopted is when you're a kid it doesn't seem like anything i mean i think it would be different it was i think it would be different like like if you were a black dude adopted by white people yeah. or if you were like eight like my cousins are adopted too and they're asian i think they sent and even my sister um like it wouldn't be crazy for me and my brother to be my parents kid you know what i'm saying yeah. like it doesn't turn heads in public like my sister is more like whoa like she has like red hair and freckles and stuff. And I think she felt like more of a outcast or whatever. But it's funny being adopted, like it seems so normal when you're a kid and it is normal. Like my parents yeah. are the shit. But like when you get older, you start to like, as I get older, I start to see the bigger picture of life and whatever. Yeah. And you and you start to be like, oh, that is different than the normal people. You know, when you're a kid, you think everybody's situation is kind of like your situation. Yeah, it's hard to tell the difference because you don't know what they're going through because all you know is your existence and your little bubbles. Yeah, you just think they're like you. Now uh, now I'm at the age where everybody I know is a parent. I'm about to be a parent. So you realize that we don't know what the fuck we're doing. Nobody does. Can we talk about that? Like, how are you feeling about, you know, becoming a dad? <sighs> I'm, it's gonna. It's less than two months. Uh, it'll be my first kid. I'm an older dad, you know. My wife might get mad at me, but I, I apologize in advance. I, people like, people know that I'm about to have a kid, and especially people that already have kids. They're like, God, you must be so happy and so excited, and f and, and I'm not. I'm full of fucking terror. I'm full of fear and anxiety and I'm just I'm scared it's a scary thing dude it's a huge life change you know so I totally feel you on that I've been fucking living in a kind of narcissistic like the life of an artist is a narcissistic life you know what I'm saying no I just it really pursue is pursue whatever the fuck I want to pursue and I've only you know I'm re now I'm married that's already a big step in itself and now I'm having a kid and I I'm only saying this to be completely honest I don't I, I know that I'm I know that I'm gonna feel I know that I'm gonna feel happy but right now I, I only feel scared and I think I, I think it's a good thing because it means I give a shit 
Yeah, and do you think part of that is just not knowing what to expect? I, I feel like part of my life as an individual is ending, but I also really even more so, I think that I don't know that I'm prepared for this. I don't know that I'm good enough. I make like, I make like little mistakes at home and I feel like, oh, if I do that when I'm a dad, my fucking kid's going to die or something. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I know that took it a little too far with the death thing. But you do have thoughts like that. The fact that I'm scared maybe is good because people that aren't scared of something. I think it shows they, that you they care. Don't care. Shout out to uh, Noms. My boy Noms. Love you. Uh, from the group Mayday. He told me one time, he's a really good performer. He's a percussion player, a break dancer. He's just a fucking dope-ass performer. And he was like... You know, people that don't get the jitters, people that don't get stage fright, it's because they don't respect the stage. Mm. He's been pre performing since he was a little kid, and he said it really matter-of-factly. I always remember him saying that. I think that's kind of related to how I feel about yeah. becoming a dad. So I think it's good that I'm scared. I don't feel happiness. I feel anxiety and and scare and fear. Well, I think once you're in it and you are a dad and your kids around, I think that feeling will probably change just because things that you're probably worried about right now, you might be overthinking it in your head versus like what the actual situation might be. And I think you're right. I think that once it happens, I mean, I love kids. I, I have so much joy with, I have four nephews. I'm only saying that I don't feel happy right now because I'm just, I just don't. I could lie, which I do sometimes because, because I don't want to fucking go into the, I don't want to have a conversation with you about how I really feel. You know what I'm saying? But I think this is also just coming from a place of you wanting to be the best possible dad that you can be, but you want to be a good father. You want to do everything right. But I think you said it before, there's not really a handbook. And I think there's a million ways that you could be a good dad. You know, right. I don't think there's this one dry cut way to be a dad. I think once you're in there, you're just going to figure out how wax is a dad. After that, I think you'll just have a lot of fun. And I personally, as your friend, am excited for this chapter for you. You know what I mean? So. I appreciate that, man. So. I appreciate that. And, I, and I'm getting a lot of that kind of support. I think people are excited about the fact that I'll be a dad. Yeah. And and I know, like, again, I can't stress enough. I know that I'm going to be happy. Yeah. I'm not I'm not saying, like, I'm not going to be sitting there with my Two month old daughter, like oh, this fucking sucks. So, you know, I know, I know that I'm gonna feel joy and love, and I know I'm going to. But yeah. right now, it's like stage fright in a way. Think about like being nervous before a show. This is like an endless show, dog. You know what I mean? It's like a new, it's a new introduction to your life. That is part of it, I think. I'm really, really blessed the fact that I get to be an artist for a living, and I get a pretty decent amount of passive income from people yeah. streaming my music. And I'm, I'm making the choice. I'm like, when my daughter is here. Like the first year of her life, I'm not doing no shows. I'm like, I'm f going full in. I want to go full in. I think that's really important actually too. You know, I've been doing this stuff for a long time. I, I want to take a kind of a break, but it's like, I'm finding it's not easy to do. Like already, like the moment I'm trying to slow down, I'm getting opportunities. And like, you can't, t I'm, I'm like bred to be like, you can't turn down opportunities. And yeah. I also think that like, I really love what I do so much that I that shutting it down, like kind of like. It's, it, I'm scared to do that too. I don't know. You're going to want to have as much time with your daughter. So when those opportunities come, you know, you'll choose in the moment if it makes sense for you to do, like if this is something I should prioritize. But I think the time that you do have with your music, you're going to become way more efficient because you're not going to want to just be making the music and lock yourself in the studio all night. Yeah. You got other priorities. I've heard from other artist fathers that that happens and it's already happening. I mean, your time is worth something too. And especially as you introduce like a new person into your life, your daughter, your time is going to become even more valuable. If you value your time with your daughter high, like everything else goes up because it's like anything else is just taking my time away from my family. 100%. 100%. I think that's just part of everything you're feeling, dude. But I know that once you once you land and you're there, I'm telling you. Man, I love you as a podcast host. <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying it, dude. Yeah, I could see it being almost therapeutic for your guests, especially people that might have, like, have any kind of, you know, going through any kind of situations. I could see you bringing a po putting a positive, positive spin, spin on, on it. it. Yeah. And you walk out and being like, damn, I really am Mike Squire's friend. Yeah, dude. I mean, I'm really happy you're here. I'm excited for this. And, you know, I want to get back into a little bit of your music. And sure. what was the type of music you were making when you were with your band? The band that I'm talking about that opened the, the McDonald's. Yeah. From when I was like 15 until I was like 25. And we had a, like a, that's a pretty long time, you know? That was in Maryland. And then once the band broke up, which was not my choice, but the band, you know. It happens, yeah. What happens, people go their separate ways. The band's not making money, blah, blah, blah. But we, like, toured and made some albums and stuff. 
And this was back in the di- back when it was like a little harder for a band to make an album. Like you had to like go to a studio and pay for the time. Like you didn't just have a homie who had a laptop. You know what I'm saying? Like it yeah. was like a little more harder. But uh, we made. I would definitely describe it as funk. Okay. But we would have like rap vocals and singing vocals. Then we some some stuff leaned a little bit more rock, and then some stuff leaned a little bit more like like seventies funk, like yeah. James Brown stuff. You know what I'm saying? If you listen to it now, you I mean it's 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 not as funky as James Brown. Like like we were a little our timing was that wasn't great all the time, although our drummer was a beast. So were you waxed back in the day as part of that band? Yeah. yeah. I've been waxed for a long time. If I had made my name recently, I wouldn't be waxed because it's really a problem. There's a lot of other artists named Wax and it, it's all like it's always a problem. Like, you know, other artists have a show in fucking God knows where and people go there to see me. People come to my show because they and they think they're seeing another artist. It's hard to search. But a hundred times at least like the wrong thing has been put on my Spotify. If you go to my title page right now, it's like fucked. There's so many people named Wax. At what point from the end of the band do you start your solo career as Wax? Mm. Well, I made a, I made like an album as Wax when we had the band, okay. but that was like 2000 or something like that. In 2004, when the band broke up, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to pursue music. And you got to understand that at that time and and from where I'm from, it's really a really, really difficult dream to achieve reali- yeah. realistically, to make a living off music. Uh, it seems like you would have to... Get, at least get a record deal or something, you know. Especially during that time too. It wasn't. It wasn't like now where you have YouTube and TikTok and all this shit where you can like actually make. You could just live at your parents' house and make something that the world can see. Yeah. You know it wasn't like that. It was different. Where I'm from and when I'm from, like people on TV and shit at that time, like you might as well have been on Mars. Like that's not. That's not an achievable dream. You know what I'm saying? It was very seemed very difficult. Yeah. So I tried to stop. You know. And then uh, in 2006, I moved to San Diego, just not to do music, just because my girlfriend at the time got a job out there through a friend of a friend. And I was like, kind of young. And I was like, fuck it. Let's, what, what else I got to do? You know, I'm, I'm always working on music the whole time because I, I would do music if it, if nobody listened to it. It's a hobby. You know what I'm saying? I do music the way people play golf. It's your passion, dude. Yeah, You're I passionate love, about I it. I love making music. And I always have since I was a little kid. So, like, me and my brother made this album, the Wax and Herbal Tea album, Grizzly Season, which is on Spotify. Me and my brother made this album, and it was kind of like just, it wasn't really like, it was, I, you always hope that it's going to somehow blow up. This is like MySpace days, yeah. you know? So you're starting to see the internet, like, kind of being, like, more powerful, you know? Yeah. And um, I was going through some shit. My girl and me broke up. She moved back to Maryland. I was just, I was in San Diego having fun, but I was working construction. I was really, really, really uh, partying a lot, but I wasn't um, doing anything that I thought had a good future to it. I decided to pursue, I I decided to go back to school. I I signed up for the Los Angeles recording school, Okay, which is like an audio engineering school in LA. And I moved to LA. I didn't know one single person in Los Angeles. I never even no, I think I'd traveled. I think I'd like traveled through Los Angeles once before, but uh, I basically was like, I need a new start. I'm not doing anything here. Let's go. And at the same time, saw a potential in the internet because Vibe Magazine had this contest online where you film yourself rapping and put it up on on their website. Yeah, and people would vote on it. And the winner would get like a record deal and some money or something like that. And I didn't win the contest, but I entered the contest. Yes. And a lot of people saw the video and a lot of people liked the video. And uh, I was just like, oh, shit. That's what made me and my brother start our own YouTube page. Because YouTube, awesome. like, YouTube, YouTube, it just dropped. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> that happened at the same time. Us, like, starting a YouTube page and finishing our album and me moving to Los Angeles to go to recording school. Because I was like... You know, I try, I've tried, I tried to do construction, landscaping. I have a college degree. I did like office jobs. I did like administrative assistant. I did tech support at a hotel software company. I tried to sell, I sold mortgages for a while and I did all this stuff. And I was just like, let me just fucking try to be in the music industry in some kind of capacity. I went to recording school. I wanted to learn you know, I wanted to learn too. I wanted to learn how to use Pro Tools myself so I didn't have to pay for a studio. I wanted to learn like more about compression and EQ and shit, you know? So I went to school for it. 
Did you have a moment that was like a game changer for you? I had a couple moments. One one moment that was a game changer for me. When I first started doing YouTube and I started gaining a fan base online, like, yeah. you know, I started a couple little revenue streams. Like, I might get 100 bucks a month from YouTube AdSense or whatever when they started monetizing it. Yeah. Then I might sell two or three t-shirts. It all adds up. I mean, at first it adds up to 50 bucks. Yeah. But then, like, you start to be like, oh, this shit pays my phone bill. Oh, this shit pays, like, half of my rent. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is, my little, little moments are so funny. Uh, these contests. A1 Steak Sauce had a contest on YouTube. <laughs> That's so random. They were random. like, make a, make a song. Make a song for A1 Steak Sauce. And I won the contest. That's so fire, I got a $5,000 check from Kraft Foods. Bro, that's like, honestly a flex, dog. <laughs> <laughs> that's like a, A1 Steak Sauce? Yeah. That's so you cool, You can still dude. see it. They, it was called Make My Beef Sing. And they had a contest on YouTube. And like a, a bunch of people entered and like I went hard promoting it because at this time I really needed the money. This is was really bad. I got a DUI at the time. Yeah. And I really needed the money. And uh, fi it's funny how different $5,000 then feels now. Oh, like $5,000 yeah. is awesome anytime, but yeah. then it was life changing, you yeah. know? Yeah, you it down. was life changing at the time. And that was a big moment for me. And then it's, it's strange to think about how how soon after this actually happened, if you look, it was like less than two years after I got a record deal. Like when I was first in LA and I first started gaining some traction on the internet, like I ended up having some management that was like more in the Los Angeles music business. Yeah. And I kind of got pretty lucky. And then I got this meeting with a, with a legendary dude and he ended up giving me a record deal. And I got signed to Def Jam Records and they gave me an advance and they had a check that was like, what the fuck? You know? <laughs> That's amazing, dude. Yeah, I squandered the money. <laughs> it wasn't completely irresponsible squandering, but it was like mistakes. Two main mistakes. Okay. When you're like from fucking some small town in Maryland, you know, my mom's a school teacher. My dad worked for the Navy. We don't know about fucking entertainment stuff. The music you know business is hard to understand if you're not in it, you know? and It's it's, it's hard to understand if you're in it. It, you it is hard to... You can't tell me you understand your ASCAP check. Where the fuck did they get those numbers? You could send me a $10,000 or 10 cents, and I'd be like, all right, cool, ASCAP. Yeah, whatever you say. Yeah. <laughs> they, you thank you, ASCAP. So when you're green, and even when you're not, like, yeah. you go by... They tell you, like, oh, this is standard. Oh, this yeah. is standard. Oh, this is what people do. Oh, everybody does this, yeah. you know? Be careful with that. It's dangerous, Be though. careful with industry standards, and this is what people do. If you get a record deal and people around you tell you that you got to get a business manager, no, you don't. You don't need a fucking fancy schmancy business manager because you don't know yet that you're going to be successful. Yeah. So I got this business manager, great people, by the way, as individual people, everybody that I fucking, almost everybody that I met in the music industry, whether it be at the record label or at the publishing companies or at the, um, the law, my lawyer is the shit. He still is. He's still, he's still the shit. When you get a good business manager, manager, if they're in a firm, you might not even fucking realize it. Cause you're an idiot like me. Like I'm just fucking partying. And I was a big uh, I'm an alcoholic. I was a big drinker and fucking rager and just, I was excited, man. And, uh, yeah, cause it was an exciting time. Dude. I had never had that much money, yeah. you know? And, uh, so, so they charge you a fee per month just to like the retainer, you know? And like yeah. that shit adds up and like, they're not doing that much. They're not doing shit you couldn't do. If they give you money and they say to get a business manager see if you got somebody in your like not don't get your fucking uncle rick that fucking runs a ponzi scheme yeah. you know what i'm saying but like get somebody that's gonna put it like do something responsible with it man no, and uh you. and also another thing don't have two managers i had two managers yeah. and they weren't like a team oh, no. i had one manager then another guy wanted to manage me and they like teamed up reluctantly yeah were they button heads after i got the record deal i fired one of them shot up my man sam if he sees this i really really good dude both i both great people you know but i but it wasn't legal for the for in the contract like when you sign a management contract, it's usually in the manager's favor, and that's fair. Yeah. Because what always happens in the music industry, you have your manager, then you get fucking famous, and you fire your fucking manager to get fucking Drake's manager. That happens all the time. That's why management contract standards are actually written in the favor of the manager, because the managers always get fucked because yeah. the artist blows up, and then they think they need some big shot manager. So, point is, you're not, you can't just fire your fucking manager, you know? And I did, 
And that ended up that ended up being a thing where it was like back and forth with the two managers and mm. me. We're s- trying to come to an agreement, splitting up pieces of a pie that doesn't even exist, exist. yet. Yeah, that's and yeah. Th- what the lawyer for that was expensive. So if you add my business manager, the lawyer for that, not to mention taxes. If you get three hundred thousand dollars, you got one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Not even that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? If you got one hundred thousand dollars, you got fifty thousand dollars. Not even that because five percent is going to go to the lawyer, twenty percent is going to go to your fifteen or twenty, whoever your management costs. So like, by the time your hundred thousand dollars gets back to your fucking pocket after the lawyers, managers, taxes, you got about thirty five. Do you still work or are in touch with any of them? No. The manager that I that I didn't that I stayed with for a long time that we don't really talk. Um, but we're, we're definitely still friends. And if we got together, we have, we like, we still worked together for years after that. And we traveled the world and had a lot of success, honestly. Like even after, like I wasn't with that record label, we, I like, I, I had like a hit song in Europe. You know, that song Rosanna that I Yeah, I do. What was that moment where the song went? That was a moment when you describe moments. Cause like, I didn't really have a, like my, I did get a record deal and shit, but me like being able to survive off music was really quite gradual. It wasn't, yeah. it didn't really feel like a moment. Um, but that was a moment. The long and short of it is that I made a, we did a music video that was kind of like funny, clever, and sexual. Yeah. And, and the music video for this song uh, blew up. It got, it got like millions of plays in a, in a weekend. That's crazy. And, um, Even by today's standards, that's crazy. Yeah. It was, re- it was really uh, a big thing. And it was like, I was I was a free agent at the time. Yeah, uh, somebody that worked at Def Jam's Twitter department didn't know that because they were fucking posting all about the video. I was like, do they know that I'm not on the label anymore? I was I I got an email from somebody from Warner Music Germany that saw the video and loved the song, so they gave me a deal there. I think what re- like you know they put it on the radio and stuff like that, but I think what really blew it up in Germany, if I remember correctly, is when they took the show Jersey Shore. Very familiar. They took that show and put it in German. The theme song they used was was that was my song. When German when Germany does their uh, like MTV Spring Break shit, I would know because I played several of these events. They do it in Croatia or in the Spanish island of Mallorca. Mm. And then in 2013, when my song blew up over there, it was crazy because it wasn't just a viral thing. It was like. It was pop. Like, like they signed me to Warner Music Germany, and it was the number one song. In Austria, it was the number one song for four weeks in a row on the Billboard chart, and it was above uh, Get Lucky. That's crazy. Yeah. And it was fucking nuts. And, and I would go over there and do, like, Good Morning Germany. I would do all these shits that was, like, some mainstream shit. So, I like, like one, I'm like a one-hit wonder in the mainstream world in some of those countries from 10 years ago. I, too, had a song go viral in Germany. Here, I'll run it all the way back. So... We released this song, you know, just SoundCloud, not even Spotify yet. And I emailed it to a bunch of YouTube pages. I I sat there probably without exaggeration, like 250 emails. And one of the YouTube pages was this page called Swaggy Tracks. I recently went to go look up the email because I was just curious. Swaggy Tracks? Swaggy Tracks. That's really funny. Yeah. And one, I went to go look at the email recently because I was like, what did I say to them to uh, like get them to post it? Because I don't even remember what was like my pitch on this. So I went and it was just like, oh, here's our new song coming up. Like, I hope you like it. Lo and behold, they post the song and it ends up doing like hundreds and hundreds of thousands on their YouTube channel. Dang. Yeah. And at the t- like, this is 2017. What song is this? This is a song called uh, Come Home. And we had no idea that this, it happened so fast. And I'm just assuming that this is how this happened. Like, I don't know 100%, but because Swaggy Tracks posted it, then this soccer page picked it up. And the soccer page, like millions and millions of views on this soccer video using our song. And I went to go look and see where the soccer page was based, and they were based in Germany. So... And then all of a sudden, like two days later, after this video is posted, we're on the Germany viral charts on Spotify. Out the gates, like Come Home is doing like 20,000, 40,000 streams a day because of this viral chart. And yeah, so that's like my European viral story. So that I kind of relate on that aspect. But for me, I wasn't prepared. I had no idea. I would go over there. Me, shout out my boy EOM, rest in peace. And him and my and my manager, Brian, would just go over there and do these events like... E would DJ for me. We just do one song. You know, that's what you do when you do TV. You just go there and do the one song, you know? Yeah. And it's funny, too, because in Germany, 
every TV thing is like the way Soul Train used to be. So you just lip sync. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They don't do live mics and stuff. And at that time, I was on some keep it real shit. I was like, no, nah, fuck that. We don't lip sync. And yeah. like, <laughs> they always had to change it because Wax is coming and he don't lip sync, like, you know? Yeah. Like, looking back at it now, I would tell, who gives a shit? A lip sync, if that's how they do it, just do it. Who I think there fuck? is some respect, though, in, like, you wanting to do it on your own. I think it'd be different if it was some virtuosic guitar solo. Yeah. And I'm not fucking, but it's like, it's not like it was a difficult song to perform. Yeah. But that's what I was on at the time. I was like, I thought... I think, you know, honestly, it's it comes with age and sobriety. Like, I don't care what people think as much now. Yeah. I'm less worried about people thinking that I'm good or people thinking that I'm, quote unquote, uh, I guess keeping it real for lack of a better whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like They're going to think what they're going to think anyways, regardless of if you are. You know People what I mean? are gonna think what they're gonna think. You're exactly right, Squires. That's yeah. exactly what you're exactly right. You could be doing everything perfect, but it doesn't matter. You could be the nicest human. Does not matter. They're gonna see one moment. They're gonna judge your entire life based on one line in a song. You know, and like, it's weird because they don't know you. They don't know anything about you, really. They just know what you show them. I was always worried about doing well and being good and like. Now I just want to have fun, you know, fuck it, who cares? And that's more important, dude. And, you, and you'll and you do better with that attitude. Yeah, because the whole reason you do music is because you love it. And the last thing you want is like all these outside factors kind of poisoning that love because then you it'll make you not want to do it. That's not a world you want to live in. You want to be able to create freely and put out what you want to put out without feeling judged, feeling all the pressure of outside. So that's really interesting, man. I see a lot of artists, they stop creating for them, they're creating for others, and then they lose the love and then they don't do it anymore because they just, they lost that spark, dude. Not good. It's tough. I, th I feel like it's tough nowadays because people are always feeling like they're creating for others because it's really easy nowadays for people to see what other people think of them. Yeah. Even at a lower level, like your first YouTube comment, you fucking suck. It's your first thing that you see where, where back in the day, you might, maybe you'll see, like, if you do a show, you'll feel it, you know? Yeah. And you have to suck a little bit. You have to get over it's part people of the saying game, you suck. Dude. It's part of the game. But nowadays, people are creating, forget others, for the algorithm. They're trying to please, they're trying to please a fucking computer program. Bro. Like, you can only, you have to, tr you have to try to please yourself. And nowadays, people are really trying to please a computer program algorithm i know because it's a game though and it's a game it's one of those things where it's like for the people who play like they get rewarded like sometimes you know what you i mean? know what you know what's interesting and you're you're a person that i know that's like this yes the way that you just said it is i wish that i could view it more like it's a game yeah like i, I have another friend who does really really well online who loves to create but he really really loves to look at the whole thing as a game and like success is a game the amount of views you get is a game and how how do you figure out the game and win the game yeah to me i'm to me i'm like fuck you motherfucker i don't have, like i don't have to fucking sexually i don't have to jerk you off algorithm why the fuck do i gotta please you i'm i'm i didn't get into this shit to please you yeah. i got into it to please myself you know what i'm saying yeah. i'm <laughs> <laughs> I'm jerking off. I'm not fucking you, algorithm. Oh. Whatever, sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're good, you're good, you're good. First of all, the music you have to be making is good. Like, that's like without being said. Like, right. that's like 30% of the battle. The other 70% is like all the content, the promoting it. Like, and especially if you're an independent artist, you got to do that yourself. Like, it's your responsibility to do all these things. And it's just the name of the game right now. And it might change. It's I mean, you know music, it's constantly changing. Like, the game is so different than what it was even five years ago. I'm less into the game yeah. than, I, than I was. I think I was a little bit more into the game a while back. I told you that I started as a child. Yeah. Being an artist is being a child. Yeah. What you said about judgment and people, like, it's free of judgment. Yeah. You just have your crayons and your coloring and you're a child. Being an artist truly is being a fucking child. And that's why artists have managers, because being a manager is being an adult. A man is not, it's a man yeah. manager. You yeah. know what I'm saying? That's why these things exist together. Now, when you get older or when you manage yourself, you might have to be like, I'm a child here and I'm an adult here. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, in my life right now, in my personal life, especially with my child 
my child about yeah. to be born, I have to be an adult. I have to be a man. I want to buy a house. Yeah. But really, I just want to be a child and play with the watercolors. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So I'm trying to reconcile those two worlds right now, the child world and the adult world. But the older I am, the less I want to do. I don't... <sighs> I don't want to read the comments. Yeah. I don't want to fucking play fucking please the algorithm, but I have to. Yeah. I have to. I want to. I I don't want to. I want to do whatever I want to do. And I don't want to fucking worry about pleasing the algorithm, but I want to buy a house. And I want to buy a house in San Diego. It's yeah. expensive. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Part of that so is playing the game as an artist. I have to play yeah. the game a little bit. And it's and it's and it upsets me sometimes, but but I'm trying, man. There are plenty of artists I know that thrive off of different aspects of their life. You know, all of those connecting points all come back to like, you know, content and pushing on socials nowadays, especially if you're like just getting your skin in the game now. My boy Davey used to always say, because I was my boy Davey is like a brother to me. Like I yeah. lived with him for years and we made a bunch of music together. He's like, he knows me just as good as anybody. But uh, when I used to have days where I was down, because I am I have a lot of them, uh, he would always be like, and I'd be like, I got to go do this. I got to go to fucking that. I'm gonna fucking that. And be like, hey, you don't got to go. Yeah. You get to, to go. go. Mm. You get to go. I know that people have said that, but like he, when he said that to me, I was like, it, it helped me some days. Yeah. Cause it's a, like at the end of the day, like being able to live as an artist is like, it's, a, it's unbelievable. It's a huge blessing, dude. Like there's no greater feeling. I think it's important not to take it for granted. Like your Davey said, dude, you get to do this. Like it's a privilege, you know? Like there's so many people that would love to be in my shoes in terms of the money that I make as an artist. Yeah. There's so many people that would be like that their goal is what I got. But you're always looking up. You're never looking down and being like, oh, thank God I'm not where I used to be. You're always looking up at the next ladder, you know? This is a perfect example. I used to want to pay my rent. Yeah. Guess what? I pay my rent. Now I want to own. Now what did I just say? I want to buy a house. house. Yeah. What's gonna happen when I buy? Want to buy a house? I want to buy a fucking whatever the next thing whatever is. the fucking next a hotel for playing Monopoly. But I think that brings us to an important point, dude. Where it's like you have to be happy with where you're at. It's a roller coaster, you know. It's not like a straight shot. There is always that feeling of wanting to go to the next level. What is that next thing? You want to see yourself grow. So that feeling of wanting to grow is always there it's not gonna go away at least for me i don't think what do you want what's what is, what goal. are what's not yeah what's the end goal yeah i think i just want to be in a position where you know i've created something not only for myself but like something that can like help the people around me you know i want my girl to be good i want my parents to be good i want my sister to be good like i just want to it's kind of a big responsibility to take on provide opportunity for my circle and help them but I want to do it how I want to do it because that's the only way I can do it. You know, like, do you want, do you want like, like, do you want a Grammy? You know, I'm not really as concerned about like a Grammy. Like I don't, I honestly, and, and I don't mean a Grammy. I mean like no. awards recognition. Do you want like, do you want like, do you want your people that you look up to, to be like, he's dope. You I know? don't, I don't care about recognition, I guess. Dude, I don't care about praise. I care about being happy because that's a battle in itself, dude. And especially being a creative, like, you know, one thing's going great today. It's all falling apart tomorrow. I, I just want to get to a point where I just feel like I'm very content. I'm happy. If any of that stuff happens, like if there is praise, like I'm obviously not going to be upset. It's not my focus. My focus is you know, creating a life that I'm excited to live and really happy to live and also being proud of the art that I'm creating. Like, I really want to create something that, you know, people enjoy and they take into their own life. And I like seeing what I create affect people in a positive way and get people excited about like their own lives or however they listen to my music, you know? So that's what's important to me. I'm glad that I'm talking to you today. Um, and I, ne I needed this. For you, what's your like driving factor? What's your motivation to like do all this? Like what's the thing that gets wax up and just like, I need to create, I need to. I like the creation itself. And this week, for example, I was writing some song ideas and they were actually completing, half completing the ideas that I said. At. Last week I was on vacation with my wife and had these ideas from the voice memo. Yeah. And um, I don't think, I don't think financially, uh, career wise, I don't think anybody will even hear these ideas. I don't think they'll do anything for me. 
Uh, it's actually an idea, some ideas. I've been, I sometimes try to write songs for other people. You know, I've had some, yeah. sometimes I do that. Good chance that nobody will ever fucking hear any of this shit. And, yeah. and it will just be like, to a person who just wants to win and fucking play the game, this was a waste of time. Yeah. But for me, I was so excited to get to the studio. I was like very excited to work on the shit. And, and it may, you can ask my wife, I was fucking happy. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, it was the actual creation, the joy of coming up with something uh, or having these ideas and, and bringing it to life. And just like I was listening to it in my car and just fucking with it, you know, like yeah. people say they don't listen to their own music. I fucking listen to my own music if I like it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? If I like the shit, especially right when you make it and you're kind of like, yo, this is fucking hard. The feeling you get regardless of how it performs, like the feeling you get while creating it, like is something to be cherished. It's a beautiful thing. That's the feeling that you get bought while creating is something to be cherished. That's to me. That's one of the scary things about AI, and that's just which yeah. like, people think like, oh yeah, well, it's so convenient. We don't have to create. It's like let's let's think about the well, the point of being a human being, especially if you're an artist. Like the the joy is in the creation. You know, I write a lot of my songs just kind of like sitting by the ocean, looking out. I got my guitar, and I got to be honest with you. I think some of the ideas come from somewhere else. You yeah. know what I'm saying? The ideas come from whatever, God, the universe, whatever the, the, the fucking conduit that comes to you and you just receive as this vessel, you receive these ideas. You know, most of the time, my creative process is so inconvenient. Like I'll be in bed at 2 a.m. This is the type of person I am. I'll be in bed at 2 a.m. And if I know I have like a good idea or I get this feeling, I'm getting up to go work on it because if I don't do it, Right now in this moment, I'm going to lose it and I'm not going to have it. And the reason why I continue to do it is because a lot of my best ideas come out that way. Most of my best songs come out where I'm like, oh, I need to do this right now because I'm feeling like it's a feeling, you know, and I guess there's kind of a like it relates to what you're saying where it's like, I don't know where it comes from, but. But you can feel it. Yeah. And so yeah, people call it waves. It feels like a wave rushes over you like like. If you're a rapper and you write verses, especially if you just write verses where it's like the whole point of the verse is just to be clever and fucking interesting or whatever, like where it's just like the braggadocio shit, like a lot of times it comes in spurts and shit just like come to you and come to you and come to you. And then if you sit down, like I'm going to sit down at five o'clock and blah, 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 you won't think of anything. You know what yeah, I'm saying? I've so you you have to ride. It's like being a surfer. You got to ride the waves while it comes. If not, you just sit out there and they, they, you, what are we going to I've very much learned to embrace that feeling when I feel it too, because it, like if you were to ask me to explain to you how I made one of my songs, couldn't do it. I'd be like, yeah, yeah. it'd be a lot harder for me. But I think a lot of the battle is like getting that feeling and just showing up and whatever happens, happens, you know? I think that's one of the most useful things about the... Uh, the smartphone is the the voice memos app and the Huge notepad app. Dude. You know, if you have an idea, like, like for for me, a lot of times, like, like even I, I just went to uh, I went on vacation with my wife, and like I just had all these ideas while I was on vacation. I think sometimes the the moment you fucking try to free your mind is the moment when it the freedom that you give your mind it starts coming up with good ideas. You know, yeah. So, yo, have you ever seen uh, the movies that made us on Netflix? No. It's like a bunch of fucking classic movies and they just go through like a mini 45 minute documentary about these fucking movies. That's actually very cool. I'd love it, to it see It is that. cool and some of them are great, but I, I, for some reason I just want to tell you and anybody watching this, you should watch the one on RoboCop. Okay, I would You've love heard of RoboCop. Of course, dude. Some dude, the dude that made RoboCop was like working on another movie as like a assistant or something and he just, he said, yeah, it just came to me, RoboCop. <laughs> I love it, dude. He said, this motherfucker just, and he was just there. He's like, yeah, RoboCop. You know, and then he took that and made a fuck, and he made fucking RoboCop, dog. But that's the thing. Like, I could totally see somebody, like, at the inception of that idea being like, nah, dog, what are you talking about? Like, RoboCop? Like, you know what I mean? Dog, they were like that. People thought, people didn't, people weren't into it. People didn't want to fund it and all that shit, you know? But he got it made, and now it's RoboCop. And we're talking about it when, it, you know, way, way later. And it was a fucking great movie. But it was... Uh, you got to trust your gut, dude. He just he just thought of it. And then how many times have somebody had an idea like that and not done shit? All the time, dude. All the time. Me three times a day, so don't at least. So don't fucking tell me that all you need is a good idea. No, a thousand Think about percent. the Teenage Goddamn Mutant Ninja Turtles, man. Think about how crazy that sounds. Exactly. I got an idea like that right now. Yeah. I'm trying, and I got a homie that's going to help me, and we're going to try to actually do it, because I've had a bunch of ideas that I don't fucking do, or I do it once and then give up, you know what I'm saying? I say pursue the crazy ideas, because I think playing it safe all the time doesn't really, you know, connect with people, because 
I think when you start saying like some of like how you're really feeling, you'll find that you connect with a lot more people. Right. Definitely. Definitely. It's also a thing about being vulnerable too. It's not easy being vulnerable as an artist sometimes, but it might be a little bit easier reflecting on it down the line. But like if you're dealing with it now and like putting that into a song out there for people to consume, like not only are you like telling your life to the world. My next album has some vulnerability on it. Like to the, and it's fun. It, uh, man, I'm really li liking this conversation we're having because, uh, there's a couple moments on the album where I, I listened to it recently after after being away from it for a second. Yeah. It's done. It's mixed and mastered, ready to go. It's all produced by Koosh. Oh, it's, all, it's, go, all, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome. But it's funny. There's some moments on there where I'm like, damn, like I'm, that sounds really like soft and, yeah. and weak and like emotional. And I think the fact that I even I feel a little bit like weird to put it out there is probably a good thing. You know what I'm saying? That, that there's Because it's honest, you know? I think what's going to happen too is that you'll find a lot of people relating to those moments, like maybe more than you anticipate. Whatever you're talking about in those songs, there's a lot of other people that are going through that too. I think there's actually something really powerful and strong about those moments. The fact that it may help people with their own situations too, and you almost become a voice for their, for their situation. Yeah, like when you, when you put your opinions out there, I think it's important to put your opinions out there, but it's like, for me personally, like, I don't really feel like arguing my side of the thing all the time yeah. because maybe this, and I could never be a politician because God forbid I actually like can see both sides of arguments. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Sometimes I don't, I don't feel like even having the argument, you know what no, I'm saying? I don't bad. feel like having the stress. So it's nice to just, you know, if I put out a song, I can just say my opinion. And if you're like, <laughs> I disagree with that, I can be like, all right, fine. But I think that's the beautiful thing about art too. And what's even crazier is not only will you say your opinion and put it out there, but it's going to be perceived many different ways so it's like not only there's like an endless branch of like what you're saying you that's know funny yeah because you could say it one way and then you know it, because people relate it to their own lives yep music to me is one of those careers that you can't do if you're just money hungry interesting i think it's something like as a creative like an artist you got to have that thing in you even if you're like a business-minded person too there's an aspect of you that is a create because if you're able to create and make something like you need that like you can't just yeah. be one-sided like you need to at least have that creative bug in you to like make something and like you know, care enough to learn the whole process of doing it because there is a learning curve. Like, yeah. it's not like mm -hmm. you just jump in today and you could, but you'd have to, there's a little bit of learning you got to do. Yeah, you have to like the learning. You have to enjoy the learning and enjoy the process and enjoy, I guess, the failures. You know yeah, I mean? dude, you honestly, that's huge to it too. And I think how you view your failures, failures is important too because I don't, the way I look at failures, I don't look at them like failures. I look at them as lessons. You know, it's like, okay, that didn't work, but because I did that, I learned this, this, and this. So I think kind of restructuring your mindset so in those moments you don't feel defeated or discouraged helps me at least keep going because it's so easy to get discouraged in music too because, you know, getting your song out there, like nobody hearing it, like you want to hear it for somebody they're not giving or you want to play it for somebody they're not giving you the time of day. Like I've been through all of that, you know, but it's like, at it the, is, man. Yeah, it's yeah. a tough, it's a really tough business in that aspect, too. And that's it's easy to get discouraged. And it's like for people try, like, they get really discouraged and fucking mad that nobody wants to listen to their song. And then I th that's I'll, the I'll worst. Give, I'll, give, well, I'll give a quick, like, anybody watching this that's trying to do it, uh, one tidbit is like, don't think of your music as a charity. Don't think people have to support you. No, that's real. Be dude. Like, like, people that are like, like, local artists and, and, I've been all this shit, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I've, like I've seen people get mad that nobody's supporting them or, or God forbid they did a show and the fucking the uh, venue didn't pay them 80 bucks. They only paid them 75 and they're yeah. fucking throwing a fit about the $5 or whatever, like thinking pennies when there should be thinking dollars kind yeah. of vibe. But like people, people don't have to support you and your music yeah. is not something that should be, that people should feel like they have. It's cool if they do. It's awesome. If, if they love your music, They'll be like, "Yo, I'd love to support you yeah. because your music is a your music is something that helps me. It's not it's not something that I feel like I have to support you so you can do your shit." Yeah, no, You're, you, you have to. You still have to like. You still have to provide something that is a as I guess a product that gives people a reason to support it. 
You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, it's not just, they're not, you're not a charity case, you know? Don't think, don't think of yourself as a charity case. Think of it like they, you're a restaurant and they want to eat your food. You know what I'm saying? I have one thought that changed my entire game on that exact issue. And that thought is this. Nobody owes you anything. Like how you, how bigly you preface that. Yeah, no, because it's true. Nobody owes you anything. And, and you know what? And that's the same thing as saying, because I've been thinking about this too. People always talk about what people deserve. Yeah. Guess what? This world is fucked up. It's hard. The dog. world, the world is fucked. Like the word deserve and like deserve people owe yeah. you stuff. Ah. Like granted, I have a lot, I have a lot of advantages in life, man. Yeah. I've been, I've, I'm a really privileged person. So it's easy for me to say that. Yeah. But. You don't want you don't want to think about it like like people owe you shit for sure. Uh, think of, think about it like anything else. Think about it like a restaurant. You might be you might the fucking nicest person in your neighborhood might open a shitty bagel restaurant. Yeah. <coughs> After a while, I don't want to eat shitty bagels, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'd love to support you, but like they got better bagels next door. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's that's that maybe was the, wasn't the greatest example because that sounded mean or whatever. But no, but I think there's also value in being just a good person because. There are plenty of like homies or like things that, you know, as they like start getting into music, like, you know, I didn't love all their songs at first. They know this, you know what I mean? But I love them as a person. So I'm like willing to ride that roller coaster with them as they figure their stuff out, you know? So I think there is value in being a good person because, you know, if I find someone's music that I do like and then I meet them and they're a dickhead, I'm like, dog. I don't even want to listen to your stuff anymore after that experience. It does color the experience. Yeah, man. like, and I know people say separate the art from the artist, but dog, like, it's like, dude, this dude was just a jerk. Like, what do you mean? Like, I don't want to listen to him now. Can't, that's a whole can of worms. Yeah, that is a whole can of worms. I don't know if you want to go. No, I'm going to, I'm going to seal it right now. I'm going to metaphorically seal it. There you go. Put that over yeah, there. Cause I, I've had so many fucking conversations about that. Am I opening it back up? <laughs> I know from my personal experiences when I've met artists that weren't like nice and I always keep in mind too that like maybe I caught them on a bad day and I try not to like, you know, base the entire everything off of that one day, yeah, right? Yeah, true, true. Because, you know, I think that would be ignorant to do and like, you don't know. But if it's somebody that I like have seen on a regular basis and I'm like, yo, dog, like, what's good? Like, what, what's your deal? Yeah. If someone's inauthentic, I think that's where... I start to draw the line. Being able to live your truth is aligned with your happiness, you know, because if you're not living your truth, it's going to be hard for you to be happy because you're never the person that you really feel that you are and having to like hide something or mask something like that's got to eat at you and you can't really be the happy. Like, I don't believe that you could be a real full-time happy person if you're not living your truth in some aspect, like bam, there was your sound clip right there. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> there was your, that, that we just did this podcast for however long we're doing it. That little clip you just said, bam dog. That's fucking viral right there, dude. I love that. <laughs> it's just it's real just, dog. I like I think that's like, but what? even the colors on your jacket and shit, the way you looked to what you kind of presented a fucking thing when you said that, that like, you can never be truly happy unless you live your truth. Like I think that I think that you're is that the name of the episode? Your true your true calling as an online podcast guru was officially born just now, and I'm so happy that I was here to witness. How did it, it look? Looked amazing. Let's go. <laughs> it looked good. Felt good. Sounded good. Woo. What are the other senses? Smells. Yeah, it doesn't really have a smell. Okay, well that's better than having a smell and it being a bad <laughs> smell, right? <laughs> yeah, but maybe if you had some funky like it would you're pretty far away from me for your breath to get this far, but yeah. maybe it would have helped actually. I got coffee breath right now. Perfect. <laughs> and I appreciate you coming on the pod, the new pod. Being honored to be here, dude. Let's go. Wanna do like a plug for anything you got coming up, dude? Uh, wax.com.com. W A X D O T C O M dot C O M. I'm at Big Wax B I G W A X on both Instagram and Twitter. I think on TikTok talk, somebody had Big Wax and I'm Big Wax with two X's. My new album is called Lifetime Achievement Award. It's entirely produced by my boy Kush Modi. Um, it has a nice vintage feel to it. It has a very cohesive feel to it in that it's all in the Kush Modi sound world. It's very like, uh, it's all live instruments, you know? Yeah, thank you for coming on the pod, and I guess that's that. Comfortable dude. chairs, dude. I'm going to tell anybody you want on the guest, if, if you want me to find some guests. Oh, I'm in, dude. I'll be like, yo, comfortable chairs, dude. All you got to do is fly to Connecticut. Yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, dude. I appreciate you. All right, I appreciate you too, man.